Hi, I'm Dr. Van der Vakorska, and this is Inequality Bites. This is poetry redefined, fathers from the left behind, novels of a different kind, need to make a state of mind. Look how our minds are getting sent down to mind. Take a look at our strengths all combined. This is Inequality Bites, the podcast where we discuss how we can make society more equal so that everyone can flourish. In this series, we will speak not only to experts on a range of different inequalities, but vitally also to those at the sharp end of inequality. Inequality Bites is created by the Equality Trust, the charity working to improve quality of life in the UK by reducing social and economic inequality, because more equal societies are better for us all. In today's episode, we're delighted to be talking to Dr. Fran Darlington Pollock, who's a lecturer in population geography in the Department of Geography and Planning at the University of Liverpool. As a population and health geographer, Fran's research focuses on understanding inequality in society, with a particular interest in marginalised populations and transitions over the life course. Fran's PhD explored ethnic inequalities in health. She's a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society with the Institute of British Geographers and of the Higher Education Academy. So hi Fran, welcome to Inequality Bites and thanks so much for joining us today. Hi, thanks for having me. So I'd like to um, start at the very beginning, as the song says. Um, and so could you share with our listeners a little bit about your background and how and where you grew up? So just after we were born, I'm a twin, we moved to Wyoming in the United States. My dad had an academic job there. Um, we weren't there for very long, moved back to the UK, and he had a choice of two departments or two universities that did his type of research. So we ended up in Manchester. Um, since then, I've been to Sheffield when I went to uni. I then moved around a bit with work, London, Leeds, Leamington. I'm now back in Manchester, but working in Liverpool. Right. So it's obviously in the genes coming from an academic family. Was, was there ever any other choice for you? I think my dad might have been mildly horrified that I was deciding to go down an academic career. But um, it was certainly something I was always interested in. I used to like going and watching him do the kind of outreach lectures and hear him talking about it. But he was an engineer, so a very, very different field. OK, it's good, good to get a bit of variety around that Christmas table sometimes, isn't it? So when did you first notice that inequality existed? I think I'd always been aware of the fact that people, some people had things and some people didn't. You know, at school, some would go skiing and some wouldn't. Some would have designer trainers and some wouldn't. But I suppose those were kind of relatively trivial things compared to some of the other events that I noticed. So I remember at school, we had someone who, after the genocide in Miranda in the early 90s, came and did a talk about it. And hearing about the kind of impact on these communities on their lives really affected me. And I then remember doing things like, you know, we used to go to church when we were younger and persuading the church to turn the kind of jumble sale into one of the Blue Peter appeal, bring and buy sales to kind of campaign and raise money for local issues. So it was, I was aware of these issues. I was aware of differences, but I'm not sure the language of inequality or the idea that these kind of differences in fortune were actually an injustice really occurred to me till I got to university and started looking into things around health and healthcare in the context of human rights. So it was quite late on that the actual idea of inequalities came in, but it was always in the background of what I did. And I think that's really interesting, isn't it? Because so many of us have grown up thinking that inequality is something that happens over there. You know, we've seen all of those pictures of starving children in Africa. And I remember, you know, 1984, Band-Aid, all of these things and, and never really thinking that it was something that applied to us in our country and, you know, how wrong we were. So you've, you've spent time in London and Leeds and a whole range of places and also, I think, in New Zealand. And how does inequality look different in those places? Well, I suppose as a geographer, it's really relevant to think about context and scale. And the, the way in which these things matter for inequality is really important. So if you look at New Zealand, which at the moment, many of us will be looking to with kind of like starry eyes, thinking about, wow, what a, a socially liberal party. Um, look how diverse the cabinet is, um, a kind of party for equality. But actually, the context of inequality there is this tension between the New Zealand European settlers and the indigenous population at Maori. So there's kind of real systemic inequalities in health outcomes there. This kind of process of social, economic and political discrimination that is imbued in the way they live. And actually, if you talk to people there, they just dismiss these differences in, in health, for example, um, by, by lifestyle habits. So the kind of things that we start talking about, or if you look at government policy, it kind of turns it to, oh, it's the individual. It's not, it's the wider context. But then say in London, in Liverpool, in Manchester, you can really feel it. And actually, particularly in places like London and Manchester, I can remember living there and thinking, 
wow, this is a huge amount of uh, my income that's disappearing on rent. And then talking to people when I was moving away and the the huge difference in what I was going to be living in, say, Sheffield or Manchester compared to what I could afford to live in London. So you do see differences in the nature of inequality, but it is bound up in the wider context, particularly the politics of those places that matter. And do you think, you know, coming back to housing um, and those huge differentials between London and the rest of the country and even starting to see Manchester, Liverpool, Birmingham, their city centres being used for development and the same sorts of things happening there. Do you think there's a really big difference between the sort of urban inequalities that we see and rural inequalities that often aren't really talked about? Absolutely. I mean, the shape of inequality in a city is going to be different from what you see in rural areas. And that's also shaped by the population that lives there. So you're more likely to see older populations in rural areas. You're less likely to see very diverse populations in rural areas. So the experiences vary between urban centres and rural areas, but also spanning out from urban centres. You have very different experiences. So once we might have had inner city ghettos, now we have these very trendy apartments taking over. Um, you see in Manchester, for example, regeneration of places like Ancoats and New Islington. And it's very, very different to what it once might have been, very different living styles. And the, the experiences of the people there are different from the experience of, say, someone who is living in a rural community that may be isolated from different services. The housing needs are different. And I think, I mean, you know, as a fellow Northwesterner, I have to say, um, I've seen Liverpool and Manchester change so much over my lifetime. You know, going there as a kid to the nearest biggest town, the city centres were so different. I mean, if you look at Toxteth in Liverpool, that, you know, was was where a lot of the Afro-Caribbean population lived and now has been taken over and gentrified by the university and others. And it's it's this dispersal, isn't it, of of people from the city centre. So how do you see the the changes of those sort of almost mini Londons in a sense and the local communities that are perhaps being pushed out and, of course, also attracting commuters coming into those centres as well? What, how does that make the city feel? It can make it feel very different and it can make it feel very alienating. Again, as a geographer, we, we talk a lot about the ideas of feeling in or out of place and that sense of place. And people who once may have felt a particular attachment to a particular place may, as areas change over time, as you see different types of investment, different types of buildings being created and the buildings being really important. If you're creating lots of flats with, say, one or two bedrooms, maybe one family bathroom and one ensuite, which is what characterises a lot of the flats in the city centre of Manchester, these aren't for families. These are for young couples or for pe- houses of multiple occupancy. So it does change the, the experience of people are living there and may force people to move away. And again, you talked about the idea of Toxteth being kind of overtaken by the university. These are these processes of things called studentification. So rather than gentrification, where we see kind of um, middle class people moving into uh, new and upcoming trendy areas, it's the students taking over. And that does mean that people will feel marginalised. You would look down your road if a load of students moved in and be wary of are there going to be particular parties at particular times of year when you have the big change of address as it happens? Is there going to be a lot of rubbish, old mattresses put outside? It does change that community feel. And as universities kind of take over more and more different parts of the city, you're going to see other people having to move outwards and in different ways. And again, we'll see that with the way in which commuters move in and out of different places. You know, I live in Manchester, I work in Liverpool, so I have a very different commute to some people who might also live in the city centre, but work within the city centre. Well, I love that new phrase, stew gentrification. Stew gentrification, <laughs> yeah. Stew gentrification, that's brilliant. That's a new one for me. So um, I think it's absolutely true, though. I mean, I've seen that even in the area where I live, where, you know, these huge student blocks are built and it does, you know, it really does change the facilities that are there as well and the sorts of shops and the sorts of, you know, um, facilities that are in the area that, that people can use. So it does have, does have an impact. So coming back to, you know, as we must in this time, um, thinking about COVID, it's really brought to brought into sharp relief the issues around health inequalities. And obviously, you know, many more people are aware of this. We're hearing much more about it in the news. But can you take us back to sort of pre-COVID times and tell us a little bit about what the health inequality problem has been in the UK and, and sort of why are we so behind so many other countries? Well, unfortunately, we weren't doing that great. So 
when COVID hit, we were at a time when it was really coming into public attention that despite over 100 years of sustained improvements to life expectancy, all of a sudden around 2014, 2015, that changed and the rate of improvement stagnated. And actually, by 2018 now, those that rate of improvement has stagnated such that some people, particularly people in the poorest areas uh, and the poorest people in England, have lost years to their life expectancy. So I think Michael Marmot described this as a health crisis, and he's suggesting that, you know, this isn't being hyperbolic. This is really a health crisis. If we're no longer seeing improvements to our life expectancy, the ultimate marker of health, what is going on in society? How is that society not flourishing? And when you're seeing inequalities in that, so it's not just a kind of unilateral stop. It's that some people in some places are losing years, whilst others perhaps are ticking along okay. That's a real crisis. That's a a social crisis and a moral crisis and a political one. So that was the context in which the pandemic started. We were not doing well. And the reasons why we'd got to that are what we were just coming out of was a decade of fiscal austerity. And there is a lot of debate around why we saw this stalling to life expectancy. And we have actually seen some of these stalls in other parts of Europe, also in the United States. But the particular experience of the stall in the UK is not to do with things like changes in flu, changes in the um, the weather. Um, it's to do with a wider set of policies that impacted on or impacted disproportionately on poorer people, on poorer places, changing their access to social support, changing their experience of things that determine health. So those social determinants of health, the conditions in which we're born, in which we live, work, grow and age. If you change the nature of those exposure to social determinants of health, whilst also also squeezing the support services that are in place to protect against any issues in those determinants. So, for example, if you have rising levels of unemployment, but also squeeze um, support services, change the nature of benefit provision, then you're not giving the safety net for it. So that's why you then see a wider impact on health. And that's a lot of the reasons why we saw that stalling and then falling life expectancy. And that was before COVID had started. So, as you say, you know, not a very convincing picture before COVID started and a very threadbare social security system. I think we can all agree on that. And many more people who've been thrown into that system now are recognising just how little cover there is in social security. I mean, in effect, to the point that the government has actually put it up for £20. And obviously, you know, we're all campaigning to make sure that that very small but vital measure um, is supported and continues. The other thing that we've seen during the pandemic, obviously, which speaks to your area of area of expertise um, on marginalised communities, is the relationship between more exposure and higher death rates in terms of ethnic minority communities. And I wondered if you could speak a little bit about that and, you know, how has policy played a role in this? Yeah, so let's just first imagine the kind of ideal situation in the context of this pandemic. So you have a stable, secure job. You live in a house which you own. You have a spare room which magically transformed into an office where you have dependable Wi-Fi and can equip it. And you also have a job that pivots quickly to allow you to work at home. You have a garden. You have a car. You have a kitchen big enough to store two weeks of nutritious food. You're okay. It's hard, but you're okay. Now, as soon as you start changing that, let's just think, for example, let's add in some children that you have to homeschool. Let's take away the garden. Let's turn it into a flat. Let's increase the proportion of your monthly income that you're spending on housing costs, whether or not that's your mortgage or your rent. Let's change that job. It's no longer something you can work at home, but you're not one of those frontline applauded workers um, in healthcare system. You're a cleaner or you're a bus driver or you're a security guard. Now, let's think about what that means for your exposure, your risk of exposure to the virus. You aren't secure in your situation, nor are you actually readily able to adhere to the policies that have been designed to apparently halt the pandemic, policies that were designed from positions of power and security, not precarity. Now, ethnic minority communities are already living in those sorts of vulnerable situations. So having jobs 
that might be characterized by this inability to pivot and work at home, jobs that are towards the bottom of a social hierarchy. They're also living in situations that even before the pandemic would predispose them to poorer health outcomes, being more likely to have chronic long-term health problems because of the socioeconomic situation in which they find themselves in. It's not that they're black, it's not that they're Asian, it's what being black or Asian means in this society, in our socioeconomic system. And if that's ignored in policy and how it's created, which is what happened, these blind policies that just thought, okay, this is how we'll be secure, or this is how most people will be secure, forgetting that there's a huge level of precarity. And you said before about more and more people coming into this awareness of the need for benefits. Yeah, we're just bringing more and more people into this condition of vulnerability. And this is stuff that um, I and the team at the University of Liverpool are looking at. We're researching the nature of how this precarity interacts with experiences or uh, experiences of the pandemic. But if you just kind of take all that for the whole population, that's one thing. If you add in systemic racism, structural racism to the mix as well, it's really no wonder that we saw this disproportionate impact on ethnic minorities. And it's really, it's, it's, it's almost a crime to actually start saying, oh, it's because people are black or, oh, it's because people are Asian. That's completely relegating everything about it. It's dismissing these differences as kind of something about their genetics, which is surely something we should have stopped talking about quite a long time ago. Absolutely. And I think that was the first port of call, wasn't it? When we started to see at the beginning of the pandemic, many Asian doctors, many black frontline workers in health and other areas um, disproportionately affected. And the first thing was, is it a genetic thing? Um, and then, of course, all of the groups who were working on equality or race or any of those areas immediately said, no, it's not. And then later we got the the evidence from the index of multiple deprivation of seeing that the the higher rates were linked to those areas that were most deprived. And it became about the economics, about the socioeconomic status. And of course, you know, that's something that at the Equality Trust we've been talking about for over a decade, as have many others. And it's, it's very bittersweet, isn't it, to suddenly see that awareness of the situation. And I think you're absolutely right about the policymakers. You know, we know the mistake with universal credit was obviously having a system where you get paid monthly, because of course, you know, most people in offices making policy get paid monthly. Why would they ever think that anything else would be the norm? And that had the tragic result of forcing hundreds of thousands of people into debt. So, you know, we, we're always saying that we need to have a more diverse range of people feeding into policy, but also making policy. And I think if COVID has shown us anything, it's exactly what you've just said. So obviously, as a geographer, and you've you've touched on this several times, you're interested in these regional disparities. So we've sometimes seen maps of, say, a London tube station with life expectancy on that or a Manchester um, bus line. So can you talk a bit about how exactly the geography is at the heart of this? Yeah. And you know what? I'll start with an example. So a couple of weeks ago, my twin who lives 15 miles away gave birth. Now, that baby 15 miles away, if it had been born where I am, would expect to live an extra three years than where it's going to be, than where it's been born now. So that's a really small spatial context in which to think about three years on your life expectancy. If you went 200 miles north up to Glasgow, he'd lose another three years on his life expectancy. And if I went 200 miles da uh, south down to Westminster, he'd gain about four. Now, it might be easy to convince yourself that a difference of 200 or 400 miles might be enough to explain why there's some kind of impact on your life expectancy. But I think it's impossible to suggest that a difference of 15 miles should allow for that. But we do see that. And this shows you, just as you said, those kind of that lives on the line map where you go along tube stops and see huge differences in life expectancy, shaped by the kind of people who live in particular places and the services available to them, the context in which they live. So people make places is a really important point. But there's an argument and it comes from people like Claire Bambra saying that politics then makes those places. So it is a political choice whether or not you invest in a certain area, whether or not you change the job market of a certain certain area, whether or not you support the housing market of a certain area. And all these different markets shape the opportunities that individuals have. So if you have really defined systems, which mean this is where all the investment is going, say in London, and you're just going to leave other areas, then you're going to start to see big differences in all kinds of opportunities, which then ultimately manifest in differences in life expectancy. So it's very much about the specific 
the specifics of where you live and the specifics of what are available to you, because that shapes your experiences as you're growing up. It kind of shapes your the socialization of your life and kind of what sorts of things you might do, what your expectations are, what your aspirations are, but also then the markets that you enter into. Which school did you go to? Did you happen to live somewhere where they were still running grammar schools? Did you happen to live somewhere where it was easy to get into the best performing school in that area, grammar school or not? Did you happen to live somewhere where they worked really hard to level up and, and think about everybody should have the opportunity to go to university? Did they also? Did you also happen to live somewhere where they didn't just say university was the be all and end all and they talked about apprentices, other schemes, supported you as an individual? So those kind of things that really vary between places then have a huge knock-on effect on everything else that happens in your life because it matters for what job you get, then what kind of housing you're going to live in, then who you're going to meet, who you might marry, um, who you might not marry, whether or not you have children, where they then live, all those kind of different things all come back to where you were born in the first place and the opportunities that you have, which then matter for, for your health. It sounds like a really, really complicated version of game of life, doesn't it? I think we should <laughs> we should try and get a games manufacturer interested in this. You know, you have three children. <laughs> You now have no money going forward for the next 20 or 30 years. I definitely identify with that one. Thanks for listening to Inequality Bites. If you're enjoying today's podcast, would you consider donating the cost of a cup of coffee or lunch to the Equality Trust? This will help us to support young people to speak truth to power, to campaign on key issues like fair and equal pay, and to produce more online content like this podcast to raise awareness of the damage that inequality causes and how we can reduce this, because inequality is not inevitable. We understand that not everyone can donate, so if you can't, then please visit our website to sign up to our mailing list, take action on our latest campaigns, and follow us on social media. Thanks for listening, and enjoy the rest of the podcast. So on Inequality Bites, we like to discuss the vital problems, but also the solutions. So what would you say to policymakers that we've spoken about now? What would you say to them are the three key things they can do at a national level? Three key things at a national level. And I think this sounds like I'm going individual, but I think they still do it nationally. The policies tend to focus on individual behaviours. There are huge national campaigns around um, obesity, around whether or not you should have uh, fast food advertised near schools, on smoking cessation, on alcohol intake. All of this is, is relevant stuff and it does matter for health. But these are not the drivers of inequalities in health. And these are not the things that are shaping the fact that 15 miles makes a difference to three years on my nephew's life expectancy. It is the upstream factors, it is the wider political and economic factors that need to be considered. So the first thing I would say at a national level is look upstream, stop focusing on individuals to change behaviours that are constrained by the context in which they have created, which the politics have created. So that's one thing I would say. And then actually it kind of touches on something you were saying before. Building what I'd said about this idea of policies being created from positions of power level we should turn to the local knowledge that is bound up in communities and say okay you're living on the knife edge you know what it's like to live there and experience these issues so we can't make these policies we need your input so we should embed an ethos of co-production in how policy is made both at the local level but really importantly still at the national level and then finally something that I think actually I've been more switched on to over the course of the pandemic, thinking about how more and more people are exposed to precarity, to vulnerability, which is just a, a, another way of thinking about increasing inequality, is the idea of universal basic income. Let's lift people out of that precarity, lift people out of the vulnerability and allow us to close some of these unequal gaps and address social and economic inequality through measures such as that. So those are, I think, are kind of national things that we should start thinking about, some which might raise eyebrows and, and raise challenges about fiscal um, capability, but all of which would see good impacts, I think. Well, I think another thing about the pandemic is we've seen fiscal responsibility blown right out of the water. So I say keep on dreaming those dreams and thinking thinking big because, you know, we've shown that if the money does need to be available, it's, it's there. So absolutely agree with that. So after listening to Fran, 
If you're absolutely inspired and passionate about taking action, then you can sign up to the Equality Trust newsletter. You can join a local group or even start one if there isn't one in your area. You can get in touch with us and we'll help you do that. Or follow us on Twitter or check out our website. Fran, thank you for joining us. Thank you. So thanks for listening to Inequality Bites, the podcast exploring not just the damage that inequality is causing, but also the solutions so that we can create a more equal society that's better for everyone. In our next episode, we'll be speaking to Chloe and Tanuki from the Five Times More campaign. We'll be talking about their campaign and their lived experience in health inequalities, looking at why in 2020, black women in the UK were five times more likely to die in pregnancy and childbirth. Let us know what you thought on Twitter. Subscribe, like and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Acast or whatever platform you're listening on and tell your friends. See you next time for Inequality Bites.